Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live today. I'm so glad to see you all joining us in the audience for this exciting session that we have prepared for you. So thank you to everyone who's here. Um, I see we have Gunn from Norway. Uh, we have Roxanne from Pennsylvania. Must be early over there. Uh, let's see, we have Linda from Illinois. Donna from Florida, Anita from New York, and she says, good morning, um, Julianne from Italy. So thank you all for tuning in today. So glad to see you all joining us in the audience. If you haven't yet, please uh, write in and let us know where you're tuning in from. We love to see um, how we all come together from the corners of the earth uh, to, to learn about family history and genealogy. It's just, it's such a special, such a special thing that we can all come together uh, thanks to technology. So uh, sometimes it fails us, but most of the time it, it really does help us out. So we're so glad to see you all joining us today. Uh, we have a fantastic session today. Before we get to that, I'll just let you know about a few things that we have going on here on my heritage. We have a DNA sale, an autumn DNA sale going on at my heritage. So we'll be putting a link in the comments section where you can take advantage of that fantastic sale that we have going on. Um, even if it's not autumn where you live, uh, it might be a, a different hemisphere. Uh, you could still take advantage of that sale. So so we'll put a link there in the comments section. Um, besides for that, we, uh, we recently uh, posted on our Facebook page, uh, the My Heritage Facebook page, uh, and we asked, um, we asked our viewer, our audience to tell us, um, you know you're a genealogist when? And we received some really, really fantastic, funny comments. So I'll read out just a couple of them. Uh, Missy wrote to us, you know you're a genealogist when? You can remember your ancestors' names and birthdays better than your living family. <laughs> so true. Uh, let's see. We have Barbara. She said, you're, you know you're a genealogist when? You start talking to a complete stranger and you, found, you find out that you share a great-grandmother. <laughs> Um, and Ashley says, you know you're a genealogist when you get excited about census releases. So a lot of great answers there. Um, so today we're going to ask you all in our audience um, to share with us uh, how you would finish that sentence. You know you're a genealogist when. <laughs> um, so and leave a comment for us and tell us uh, what you think the answer would be in your opinion. And uh, we'll be giving away a My Heritage DNA kit to one lucky winner who comments in our audience. So one lucky winner will get a My Heritage DNA kit, a uh, fantastic prize. Uh, you can, if you've already taken a My Heritage DNA kit yourself, feel free to gift it to a friend or a family member. So we're so excited to be able to give that away. Uh, just leave a comment in the comment section and finish our sentence. You know you're a genealogist when. So um, we can't wait to be read to read all those fantastic answers from our audience today. Um, so now I just want to introduce our speaker. We have with us Chris Payton today. He's originally from Northern Ireland and he's a genealogist and writer. And today he's based in Scotland where he runs Scotland's greatest story research service at www.scotlandsgreateststory.co.uk and we'll put a link to that in the comments section as well. Um, as well as contributing to many of the UK's best known family history magazines, he also writes for his own Scottish Jeans blog, news blog at www.scottishjeans.blogspot.com. And he regularly gives talks to family history societies across the UK and worldwide. Uh, his recent pen and sword publications include Tracing Your Scottish Family History on the Internet, Tracing Scottish Ancestry Through Church and State, State Records, and Sharing Your Family History Online. Uh, and we're just so glad and excited to have him with us today, especially since uh, at My Heritage, I'm sure he'll speak about this, but uh, we recently re released uh, some Scottish record collections. It was a very exciting addition for us at My Heritage to add to our over 15 billion historical records that we have at MyHeritage. Uh, so that was very exciting Scottish news for us and we're so thrilled to be able to
to talk with them uh, to, about them with Chris. Um, so let's give him a warm uh, welcome. And especially since today is actually Chris's birthday. So uh, we're just so thrilled to have him, have him here join us at My Heritage, especially on his birthday. Hello, Chris. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It doesn't feel like a birthday. I'm, I'm dying of the cold at the moment. I got this god awful cold over the last couple of days. So at the moment, I'm going to have some whiskey later on to try and celebrate <laughs> and have medicinal intervention at the same time, you know. <laughs> I hope it works. I hope it helps. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're so glad to have you here joining us at MyHeritage. It's your first time on one of our Facebook Lives. So uh, so we're so thrilled to, to have yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. I've, I've, I've given talks to groups around the world, but I don't think I've ever spoken to the entire planet at the same <laughs> time. And I'm looking at this thing on the right-hand side. <laughs> I'm just waiting one from the moon to pop up any minute now to say there's someone up there as well. But uh, no, this is going to be fun, you know. <laughs> it is It is quite incredible. I just love seeing how, um, how our viewers are just from all over the world. So it, it's really amazing. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Great, so do you wanna, um, do you wanna tell us uh, what you'll be speaking about today? Yeah, well, today, um, obviously, uh, my heritage has now placed online the, the Scottish censuses. Now, the Scottish censuses, uh, take it from somebody who comes from Northern Ireland, from Ireland, to have censuses as, as a tool to help with the research is a really good thing. Um, in the exact same way that in Ireland we don't, because a lot of them were destroyed. So um, half of my heritage is actually Scottish and half of it comes from Ireland, North and South. So uh, the Scottish censuses are records that I use a lot you know, for my research and for research for other clients. And they're a wonderful way of really reaching back into the 19th century. And in some cases, even back into the um, the previous century, you know, people who were maybe 70 or eight years old in 1841, you're going quite a way back to find them in a census record. So what, what I'll do is I'll talk a bit about the background to the, the censuses in Scotland, and I'll talk about what's available within each of the censuses. And I'll talk a bit about what my heritage has done. Um, there, there are uh, lots of sort of databases online that provide access to the censuses, and they have their strategies strengths and weaknesses. My Heritage has also just added a, a presentation as well. There's some great things about that, one or two things that maybe you might need to look to another source to find as well. So I'll, I'll give an overview as to how they can help with your research um, and just to, to really give a steer as to what the records are and, and, and how brilliant they really are, you know. Amazing. Okay, great. We're, we're looking forward. So should I bring up your slides? Yeah, that, that'd be great if you could, Esther. Thanks. Okay, here we go. Let's put them in here. Okay. There we go. Take it away. Fantastic. So I, and uh, so as I was saying, uh, my, my name's Chris, Chris Payton. I come from uh, Northern Ireland originally. I live in Ayrshire in the west of Scotland. And this is one of the places I would regularly go to that you can see on your screen at the moment to access the original census records. This is the National Records of Scotland, which is based in Edinburgh. Um, the, the, the census records are they're one of the key record sets really for, to, for doing Scottish research, along with the birth, marriage and death records, at least when starting off. And they provide a, a structure and a framework for your family groupings as you go back in time to then uh, allow you the opportunity to look for other records to help sort of um, fill out their stories more. But the, the censuses are part of that kind of um, skeletal structure that you need to help establish who the families are as you work back in time. So what I'll do, first of all, is just going to mention a, a bit of background to the census. Now, the first census in Scotland was actually carried out, the uh, first national census in Scotland was carried out in, in the 1750s by a Reverend Webster, but it was a, a very sort of um, statistical affair. And it, it's not useful from a family history point of view, other than trying to work out how many people might have lived in a particular parish, that, that kind of thing. The, the census, as we understand it today, first evolved in the United Kingdom, of which Scotland is a part, um, in the year 1801. And the census was designed to be carried out uh, every 10 years um, with the intention of trying to work out essentially how many mouths there were to feed, uh, how many people were available, and particularly in the first census, if they needed to be called up in a draft in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars. But the first four censuses that were carried out within Britain at that point were actually um, statistical affairs. So they have some use in terms of demographic information, but from a family history point of view, there's not really a lot that we can do with them. We are lucky that in a few parishes in Scotland, the, the people who collated the statistics actually did record the names of a few folk 
and you know then extracted the statistical information from that. Most of that information has been lost, but in a few parishes, the information has survived. But by and large, from the, the, the family historian's point of view, the first census that's really of any use for us would be that from 1841. Now, the census from 1841 to 1911 is available uh, online. It has been released by the, the National Records of Scotland and its predecessors. There, there is what's known as a 100-year rule that has been imposed on census access within Scotland. And so that means that at the moment, the 1911 census is the most recent one available. The, the census from 1841 is a kind of an odd census. I'll talk a wee bit more about it in a moment, but it's kind of a halfway sort of stage really between the earlier censuses going back to 1801 and the census as it evolved from 1851 onwards. It's a sort of statistical exercise and it has some information, but then things really kick off from 1851. Now, because of the 100-year rule, the, the 1911 census is currently available through only one platform, and that's through the National Records of Scotland's own platform, which is known as Scotland's People. And, and the reason why it's only available there is it's the only census that was actually recorded in a digital format. The previous censuses have been published by way of microfilms in the past. Um, so the NRS, the National Records of Scotland and the Scotland's People website are the only platform to get 1911. And in fact, uh, this year, the 1921 census should have been released. But obviously, because of the, the COVID situation, there has been a, a, a sort of delay imposed on that. And it's now looking likely that it will be the end of next year before we see the 1921 census for Scotland. So let's perhaps a, a bit of background then on the recording of the census. From 1801 to 1851, the Scottish census was essentially carried out from London in terms of the administration and the creation of the whole thing. Administratively, it was designed in London. It was obviously carried out at the parish level in Scotland by schoolmasters uh, in association with people like the sheriff of, of each county, that, that kind of thing. But the, the exercise was actually a, an English-run affair from London and the, and the British government and the Home Office down south. But in 1854, there was an Act of Parliament passed, the Civil Registration Scotland Act, which fundamentally changed uh, things in, in two ways. It was actually the act that introduced civil registration of births, marriages and deaths into Scotland, um, which had previously been established in England and Wales in 1837, but not until 1855, north of the border. But the other responsibility, the other main responsibility that was handed to the new Registrar General, who was based uh, in this building here at New Register House in Edinburgh, is the responsibility for the carrying out of the census itself. So this was no longer run from London. It was now specifically designed to be run from Edinburgh. And there was one other responsibility that the Registrar General was given at that point, and that was to call in all the parish registers as well, because they were deemed to be um, state records, the records of the Church of Scotland. Now, in 1861, from that point onwards, the census has been run from Scotland. And the next sort of uh, thing just to be aware of, really, with regards to the census is the earlier censuses from 1801 to 1851 were actually the, the original records, the household schedules that were filled out on census night were all destroyed after the information was um, carried across into what are known as the enumerator's returns. But the information was all sent down to London. And it wasn't until 1908, with the passage of the Old Age Pensions Act, that the 1841 and the 1851 census returns, the, the enumerator's returns, were returned to Scotland and to the, the control of the General Register Office, which is now part of the National Records of Scotland. That actually happened in 1910. And the reason for that was the Old Age Pension Act required uh, people to provide proof of age. And you had to be 70 years or older to claim the state pension as it was um, from that point onwards. Now, with civil registration commencing in 1855, it wasn't possible for everybody to get a formal birth certificate showing their age. So they had to, to either rely on a parish record or an extract from the census. Now, the equivalent thing also happened in Ireland, and the National Archives of Ireland website actually shows you some of the applications that were made to the Public Record Office in Dublin asking for proof of age from the census, which was very handy because the Irish censuses were later destroyed, but these applications have survived. 
Unfortunately, the same applications in Scotland appear not to have survived. Um, a friend of mine, Emma Maxwell from Scottish Indexes, has looked into this in some detail, and I've had a look myself. We can't find any evidence of uh, these uh, applications having survived. But of course, we do have the original records now, which is a, a key thing which the Irish don't have. And one final thing, just to flag up on, on the kind of the history of the census, is that in 1941, there was no census carried out because of the Second World War. There was a, a national identity register compiled at the start of the war uh, in September of 1939, and you can apply for extracts for that from the National Records of Scotland. It's £15 per entry for, per person. And in 2021, um, the census was also supposed to be carried out this year, but again, because of COVID, that has been pushed back until the, the start of next year. So those are the two years where the, the, the kind of flow of things was slightly disrupted. And um, we are fortunate as well in that in Scotland, the 1931 census has survived, which unfortunately it, the equivalent in England and Wales has not survived. Um, it, it was destroyed during the, the Second World War, but the Scottish records, because they're administrated from Edinburgh, do exist for 1931. So we've 10 years to, to go until we see those. So let's look at the, the censuses themselves now. The, the 1841 census, this is the kind of thing that you would see if you had the original image of a census record. And the, the pages are kind of uh, designed in a kind of vertical format, and they have the names of individuals enumerated in households and a, a degree of information that has been made available. So what you tend to find within the 1841 census, the first of the, the really useful censuses, is the name of the parish in which the census was enumerated. The schoolmasters of the, the parishes were the original enumerators um, prior to the, the Civil Registration Act. And you also get the, the place of residence of an individual, usually the village or a farm or the street, whether the house was inhabited or uninhabited, the age of the individuals that are recorded. So you'd have males, the, the age of a, a male in the left column uh, under age and females in the right column. But one of the, the things about the 1841 census is that there was instruction given out that any individual who was over the age of 15 was to have their age rounded down to the nearest multiple of five. So it didn't affect children. It was when you were 15 or over that this applied. Now, in a lot of cases, that was adhered to. And so when you see on a, a census record from 1841 that everyone in the house is 20, 25, 40, 45, what it really means is there's an age range that you need to think about. If somebody is listed as age 20, it actually means they could be anywhere from 20 to 24. So this is the kind of statistical nature of this census, which is a, a bit frustrating at times. What One of the things to be aware of, though, is that some of the enumerators didn't pay attention to that and did actually write down the, the correct age of individuals. And so what you do need to do sometimes is if you can see the original census page, if somebody is listed as 15 in a household, for example, that you're looking at, Take a look at the other entries on the page to see what the context is. Has everybody's age been rounded down to a multiple of five? Or is this person actually 15? Um, and you can usually get a sense of the context and what the enumerator has done by just scanning other individuals on the page. Not quite so easy to do with the data bits, but with the original images, it's something that you can do. Then the, the occupation is recorded, usually for the, the, the head of the, the household, except the head of the household isn't designated as the head of the household. Um, one of the, the weird things about the 1841 census and a frustration from a genealogical point of view is this is the census that doesn't indicate how people in a household are related to the head of the household. So you assume that the first person is the head of the household, but if there's, a, a say, a man aged 30 and a woman aged 31 and a child aged four, it doesn't necessarily mean that that four-year-old four-year-old child is in fact their daughter because it could be a niece um, or, or a nephew or whatever. That's one of the things that you need to be careful of with the 1841 census is you don't jump to conclusions uh, about what is actually presented before you. In terms of the occupations, quite a lot of the occupations are actually abbreviated. So you might have things like FS uh, written down for a female servant or HLW for hand loom weaver or PLW for power loom weaver, that kind of thing. So this is a, a standardized way 
of recording how people were in, in the censuses. Um, it's not the case that you only get the head of the household, but sometimes it is the only person you see an occupation for. One other thing is that because the, the, the census returns that you're looking at are the enumerator's abstracts, you do also find that sometimes it's hard to prove what the original um, entry stated on the household return, but enumerator, enumerators were actually under instructions to kind of put square pegs into round holes. So some people may have recorded what they thought their occupation was in the household schedule, and then the enumerator uh, has actually changed that in the enumerator's return to say what category it best fits within. Uh, unfortunately, because the household schedules have not survived, it's difficult to show those kind of changes. And um, I've seen examples of this with English records um, uh, down south, but uh, in Scotland, you can't really prove what the original might have been. So you might need to take a pinch of salt with what the um, occupation is that is listed. And then the, the other thing about the 1841 census is the birthplace column, which is quite basic. And that you, the people who were enumerated were basically asked whether they were born within the county in which they are being enumerated, and the answer was simply yes or no, or if they were from beyond Scotland, they could state whether they were English, Irish, or foreign. So E, I, or F uh, is how you will sometimes see that. So it can be very, very basic. Now, the 1851 census, the, the format changes and it becomes a, a kind of a horizontal page that you're looking at now. And this is the, the census where things really do begin to pick up and you can understand relationships of folk uh, a lot better. So within the 1851 census, at the top of the page, you'll get some boundary information, such as the, the parish or the parliamentary borough, the royal borough, the town, the village, that, that kind of thing listed at the very top. And then you'll get the schedule number. Uh, followed by the name of the street, the place or the road, and the name or number of the house. Now, I'm just going to show you that image again of the 1851 census. On the left-hand side of the page, you will see a number. That is the schedule number. Don't mistake that for a house number. It isn't the house number. It's a schedule number. Um, and as I say, the, the schedules were all subsequently destroyed. So it's just one thing. Don't misinterpret that as the, the house number. So you have the, the name of the street, the place of the road, and the name or number of the house in the separate column. Then you have the name and surname of each person within the house on the census night and their relationship to the head of the household. This is the game changer. This allows you to work out whether you're looking at a family, an extended family, or people who are completely unrelated. You know, somebody could be a boarder or a visitor, that, that kind of thing. Then condition as to marriage, are they married? Are they widowed? You know, that, that sort of detail. And the age, and at this point, the age was the age uh, that they actually were, or at least the age that the householders returned to the enumerator. And that's a, another <laughs> story. Um, it's amazing how many people age uh, by less than 10 years between the decennial censuses um, as they get older. And then the rank profession or occupation, and where born at this point will now ask uh, an individual to put down what their parish of uh, um, wh where they were born, the parish that they were born within and the county. Um, overseas folk, again, if you have, say, Irish ancestors lived in Scotland, you will be frustrated to see that it will still say something like born Ireland. In a few examples, they will give a bit more detail or born England, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, but in Scotland, you can narrow down to the parish at this point. And in terms of medical information, there is a detail that they ask in 1851 as to whether somebody is blind, deaf or dumb. And I have some tailors in my family from Inverness, for example, and they're all noted as blind. Now, they can't be blind to tailors. What I tend to take from that is perhaps they're somewhat short sighted because they're working very closely with the cloth. I, I don't know if that, that, that's been looked into, but whether they're blind, deaf or dumb is a category that's asked in 1851. Now, 10 years later in 1861, uh, it follows the 1851 format, but it did ask for some additional information. It asked for the number of children attending school between the ages of five and 15 within a household and the number of rooms with one or more windows. Now, that can be a very useful detail, and it tends to be one that most databases actually miss out and that you only see on the original images. But what's great about it is if you've got um, family from some of the cities, for example, that some of the, the tenements in Glasgow or, or Edinburgh, Dundee, whatever, um, and you know you find there's 10 people within one household, and then you find that there's maybe one room with one or more windows in it, that's the reality of what life was like back then. They were very, very cramped conditions. Um, and it gives you an insight into the kind of uh, environment where they might have lived. 
Now, moving on to 1871, the, the boundary details at the top of the change slightly expanded. You get things like um, whether there were parliamentary boroughs or royal boroughs. These are all different administrative types that are useful for certain circumstances. I'm just not going to go into those now. Um, but another question was asked uh, whether they were deaf, dumb and blind or also whether they were an imbecile, an idiot or a lunatic. Now, that sounds a bit um, grim, really, from, from a modern perspective. But there was actually a definition as to what these terms meant. And there's a, a great publication available from the National Records of Scotland website, which is a, a Registrar General's annual review from um, 2009. And it has a, an introduction about the history of the census within it. And th this, these are the definitions that are given to those kind of uh, medical conditions. A lunatic is someone who had periods of sanity, whereas an imbecile who was someone who had later in life become demented. An idiot was mentally handicapped from birth. A moron had a mental age of 8 to 12. And a cretin had mental retardation caused by a thyroid deficiency. Now, you would not get away with that language today, but that is the language of the time in 1871. So when, when you come across the, the fact that your ancestor was a lunatic or an imbecile or an idiot, there's a wee bit more to it. That's just the terminology that was used back then. Now, 1881. The, the question about the number of children at school was removed and the boundary information again expanded uh, to include a few other sort of terms there as well. And then in 1891, in addition to the previous information, the, the boundary information again revised to include names of parliamentary divisions and borough wards and, and so on. But also some new information was required. Um, whether an employer was a worker or working on, or whether somebody was an employer, a worker or working on their own account, and also whether somebody was able to speak Scottish Gaelic um, or both Gaelic and English. Now, Gaelic is a language that's uh, related to the Irish language. And Drasda, ham ye bringaif sa Gaelic. I'm talking to you now in Gaelic. It's very closely related to the Irish language, but it survives in the western coast of Scotland and in the Western Isles. But by the point of 1891, they were really concerned about the fact that the language was in decline and they wanted to get a sense of how, how many Gaelic speakers there were uh, across the, the, the country in Scotland. So that's the, the question was asked about whether somebody could speak Gaelic or Gaelic and English or just English. Now, the 1901 census, uh, again, more revisions to uh, the uh, boundary administration. And then a further question was added asking whether a worker was working at home in addition to whether they were an employer uh, and so on. Then the question of asking if somebody was an idiot. Uh, no, they're no longer an idiot. They've moved with the times. They've decided that they needed a much more responsible way of describing that. And so they've gone for feeble minded instead in 1901. Believe me, it took them a century to, to really evolve this um, language. But at the moment, they've, they've from 1901, they, they'd moved from idiot to feeble minded. They still had a bit of work to go back then. Now, in 1911, this is a particularly useful census um, in that in addition to asking a bit more information about their occupation, uh, so not just what your job was, but to which service or industry that you actually worked for. So you could have been a riveter um, in shipbuilding, that, that kind of thing. Um, there was also another major change that, that was uh, implemented in 1911, and that was to ask a specific set of questions of married women. And these were known as the fertility census questions. This is what they've been sort of colloquially referred to. And the three questions were to ask what the duration of the, the woman's marriage was with her husband, the how many children she had that were born alive during the marriage, and how many of those children were still alive. Now, so far you might have done your research and from the, the vital records have established that maybe we, Johnny and Agnes had five children. And then you look them up on the 1911 census and it tells you, no, they had seven children of whom five are still alive. That means you need to go back to the vital records to work out who the other two were. So it's a wonderful um, detail that's been added to the 1911 census. It was supposed to only be asked of married women. Now, sometimes you will find widows have that information recorded. If that happened, it was supposed to be scored out and not included. But sometimes you will see that information surviving. But if somebody is unmarried um, and had children, you know, illegitimately, then that wouldn't be, uh, the questions would not be asked. And obviously, if they were widowed, they weren't supposed to answer that as well. Um, sometimes you do get a bit lucky on that front. One unfortunate thing about the 1911 census compared to England, Wales and Ireland is that in those three countries, the original schedules have actually survived 
and are available online. But for Scotland, the original household schedules haven't survived and there are only enumerators returns. Why is that a big deal? Well, it's a big deal if your ancestor was a suffragette. Because in the other three countries, they only too happily put graffiti all over their census return saying, why the heck should I be recording this information if you won't even give me the vote? Uh, well, you don't get that in the Scottish returns, unfortunately, because those pages were deftly dispensed with and the enumerators returns uh, are all that we have left. Okay, now there are some missing censuses from the period from 1841 onwards. Um, there is a guide to this on the National Records of Scotland website, the Census Records Guide um, on the, the National Records of Scotland, which is our national archive, has uh, detailed information on that. The, the key things that are probably missing from everyday usage are the 1841 census. There's quite a chunk of Fife uh, is missing, 14 parishes, and a few parishes in a few other um, counties as well. The, the records from Fife, I've heard a couple of stories about this. One is that they were lost um, on the way back from Fife over to Edinburgh on a ferry boat and sank to the bottom of the, the River Forth. Um, I've also heard they were lost on their way in transit to, to London. Um, but sadly, there are 14 parishes missing from Fife, and that is a little chunk that occasionally does um, become a problem when I'm doing research for folk, because a lot of folk have got connections to Fife. And again, arbitrary sort of um, random things missing from some of the other counties. One thing to be aware of is that there are some uh, parishes that are missing from the 1841 census, but it's not because the records don't exist. It's because the parishes themselves um, weren't uh, in existence at that point. They, they were created after 1841. So they might be incorporated into the previous parish that covered their territory at that point. Again, the National Records has information on that. And there are a few records missing from um, Dumfries and Dunscore in Dumfriesshire in 1881 to, to be aware of just a few of the, the books from um, the, the, the town of Dumfries and the parish of Dunscore. Now, my heritage then has placed these records online. Now, I have to say, this is actually a bit of a game changer for me. I, I've been using my heritage for some time. Um, I tend to use it a lot more for the, the DNA side of things as somebody who lives in Scotland. I've not really used it a lot for Scottish research in the past, except I have to say this week I have been using these census um, databases because they've solved problems that a couple of the, the other sites that I use have not been able to solve because of the, the tools that are available. So what is available? Well, the records available are from 1841 to 1901, and I'm, I'm presuming that they have been uh, indexes extracted from the microfilms that existed from the previous, uh, the, the images that were previously microfilmed. The, the database, uh, you'll, you'll find the databases within the, the catalogue, go to the census and voter lists uh, returns. Uh, what I'll do is I'll take a look at the 1851 um, interface and just give you an idea of a search of some of the things that you can find and, and do with this um, particular data set. So under name, uh, I would type in uh, an example. This is a, a great, great grandfather of mine called William Payton. And under the, the last name uh, box, there, there's a little drop down arrow and under one under the, the, the first name uh, box as well, which allows you a series of tools to vary the search terms that you can use. Now, one thing it doesn't seem to have, which I, I don't, I've not found or been able to work it yet, it might well be there, is whether you can use um, a wildcard. But there are various tools there, such as Megadex and Metaphone and uh, the, the Ditch uh, Mokotov Sound Deck system and all these wonderful different sort of algorithms that can allow you to look for surname variants. Now, that has been a game changer for me this week. There's been a couple of names um, from some work that I'm doing that I couldn't find on Scotland's People, which is the only site that presents the original images. But I did find them using these tools on the MyHeritage site. So this is something that I am actually going to spend quite a bit of time playing with um, over the next few weeks, just to see how far I can push this in terms of um, problems on other sites. Uh, but I've been very impressed with this so far. Under the, the birth uh, year, you can type in the year of birth. You can actually put the age in and a little tool and that's available underneath and calculate what the, the birth year might be. Um, or you can actually put in the, the year of birth and then add a plus or minus of so many years um, to, to control that. And then you can also put in a, a place name as well and, uh, and a residence information section there as well for where they might have lived in the, the census year in question. Now, under relatives at the bottom there, I know that my great-great-grandfather, William Payton, was living with his stepfather and his mother um, in 1851. But the stepmother, I know, was called Joanne or Joan in various different records. 
One, one of the tools that you can do uh, on MyHeritage is names starting with letters. So in this case, I've just typed in J-O and I've put the surname that I know she had at that point, which was Fennec. And then I click the, the, uh, the share, uh, sorry, the, the search button. And there's a list of uh, possibilities that are returned, but the first one is actually the one I'm looking for. And when I click on view record, uh, this is what I get for William Payton. I get his name, uh, his gender, a birth year that has been extracted from his age, which is later noted as 16. Um, the residence very helpfully actually gives the, the date of the census. And that is, you wouldn't, you'd be surprised at how often you actually need to know the date of the census to work out um, other things. Like if somebody is, is a few months old uh, and listed on a census return, knowing the date of the census immediately allows you to calculate back how many months to perhaps the previous year when they may or may not have been born. Then the address is given as Pomarium, which is a, an area of Perth, and he's unmarried and his occupation is an apprentice courier. And a courier was somebody who prepared leather um, in the past. Now, the next section, census, then gives me the kind of the information that is really useful in terms of the parish number, the number of the enumeration district, the, the schedule number, the line number, uh, the page number, all that kind of detail um, is very, very useful. And it actually changes between the censuses as well. Um, I mentioned the boundary information at the top of the original images uh, expands from census to census with different definitions added, parliamentary borough, that, that kind of thing. And I've noticed on my heritage that this isn't a standard thing. They do evolve it between the censuses, which is very, very handy. Um, and bear in mind as well that registration districts were established um, properly after um, uh, the 1861 census onwards. It was it was created by parish by 1841 and 1851, although the, the registration districts were based on the parishes um, when the Registrar General took over. Now, moving down the page, uh, I then get the, the names of everybody in the household. The, the column on the left is their relationship to the head of the household. Um, they give a calculated sort of estimate of their birth uh, year in the right-hand column, names in the middle, and I can see William Payton there, second from the bottom, uh, listed as a stepson of Stuart Fennick. Now, the, the next uh, section there says, spotted an error, suggests an alternative. So this is the bit where you can come in and say, that's a really nonsense transcription. I have to say, I've not found any nonsense transcriptions yet, but if there's one there that you see that you don't agree with, you can suggest an alternative and pass that through to my heritage. That, that's a great wee tool to, to have there. But the one I really like, this is one that I actually think could be a lot of fun for folk, is the final box. Um, have comments about this record, share them with my other heritage users. So in this case, I've, I've recorded here, Joan or Joanne Fenwick was previously married to William Payton, who died in Perth on November the 6th, 1838. I've given the source information, and I've said that Joan died on August the 9th, 1878, at the infirmary in Perth, age 72. This is a comment section. And, and you can add uh, information that might relate to the, the people that are noted within that census record. Now, there's only one other site that I'm aware of that really does this. I might be wrong about this, but the only site I can think of that allows census information to try to establish connections with folk is a site called Lost Cousins run by Peter Calver. And, and Peter's website allows people to upload details from a particular census. And if somebody else uploads details from a particular census, then you perhaps are lost cousins. And um, well, this is, uh, I quite like this. This is kind of the other way around. This is actually allowing you to add information to the census entry itself. So that if somebody comes along and, and sees what you have there, that can be useful to them for their research. I, I really like that as an innovation. I think that's a great wee thing to add onto the, the, the records that they have. Now, as with other databases online, there, there are some details missing from the MyHeritage presentation. You, you won't get things like the number of rooms with one or more windows. You won't get um, whether somebody can speak in Gaelic. At least I don't, haven't come across it yet. Um, but... The point is, this is a, a brilliant finding aid. If you need to find the relationships of people and how they relate to each other and where they live, this is a brilliant starting point because the sites such as Scotland's people, which hold the original records, are actually pay-per-view. And if you've got a John Smith, for example, and you want to start looking for him on Scotland's people, you'll be paying a fortune looking for the right record. Better to do it on a, on a useful database like the one that my heritage has. And then if you need that extra information from the original image or need the original image just because you want it, you could then go and buy that from Scotland's people. So my heritage has provided a very, very useful tool 
to help to to use the censuses for Scotland. Um, and as, as I say, from my point of view, I really think this is quite a game changer for me as somebody who does a lot of Scottish research because I can see myself using this version of the database um, quite a bit, actually. So that's really a, an introduction to the Scottish censuses and what my heritage has done. Um, there are some things to watch out for. I'm just going to give you a few wee tips to end on with Scottish census research compared to other parts of the UK, because we are a wee bit different up here. God bless Scotland and all of us who sail within it. So a married woman in Scotland, for example, even when she is married in Scotland and in the household with her husband and her children, you may find that she's actually listed under her maiden surname. Um, when women marry in Scotland, they don't really lose their maiden names. It's not the convention in Scotland. They take on a married surname as well. So you'll find that on databases such as Scotland's People, uh, uh, the, the records are indexed under both names for uh, a woman who perhaps when she's died, that sort of thing. Um, but in the census records, you may sometimes find, although conventionally they tend to be recorded by their husband's surname, sometimes if you're searching for a, for a woman on the census and you can't find her, try her maiden surname. That might be why you're not finding her. And in particular, if the husband has died and she has become a widow, that is often a time when uh, married women revert back to their maiden surname in Scotland. So bear that in mind when carrying out your search. The information is only as good as that given to the enumerator. So in 1851, Wee Jimmy is a deckhand on a ship. And in 1861, he's Admiral of the Fleet. There might be a slight escalation there in terms of his career path that might not be true. So in those instances, just bear in mind that the enumerator is recording what is spoken to the enumerator. And also the other way that that comes in is things like ages. You know, when, when somebody's um, 30 in one census and then the following census, they're, they're 38. And you think, OK, not bad for a 10 year census. But you'll also find it with things like um, marital status. Sometimes a, a, a woman might be recorded as a widow. Is she actually a widow? Or has her husband perhaps deserted her and she's embarrassed to tell the enumerator and so has told him she's a widow? Or perhaps the, the, the husband has disappeared and then she thinks he's dead, and but he's actually a bigamist and lives down the road somewhere. You know, all these things. You can't really tell that from the information. You can only take the information that's presented as a starting point and use that to try and, 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 and flesh out further possibilities if things seem a wee bit suspicious. So as I mentioned earlier, the, innumeral, uh, the, the original household forms were destroyed after the information was extracted. So the forms that you see on sites such as Scotland's People and the information that's available on MyHeritage is not the primary information. It's a derivative from the original primary source. It's actually a secondary source. And in some cases, things were deliberately changed, as I mentioned, with occupations in 1841. And in sometimes there were there were actually um, errors that creep, creep in when people copy things over. So, you know, you have to take it for what it is. It's a brilliant resource. It's only as good as the information that is as presented. There, there may have been some differences to the original information, which you may never be able to prove. Um, I'm just flagging up that uh, this is not a primary source. It's a derivative from a primary source. And also, just to flag up, it may also be possible to find a person recorded at two different places on the census night. Um, you know, it was a night. You could walk out one building after being enumerated, go down to the pub, and then the enumerator pops in for a quick half and enumerates everyone there at the same time. And so there you are again being recorded down at the pub. And um, so the, these things are just things to watch out for um, as you're working your way through the, the, the records. And as I've mentioned earlier, don't mistake the number in the far left column as a house number. It's the schedule number. It's, it's one of these things that I often have to tell folks it's the schedule number. It's the same way when somebody gets married in Scotland and you see two marriage entries. It doesn't mean they got married twice. It means the bands were called in two different parishes. These are some of the truisms that we keep having to tell folk uh, with Scottish genealogy. And this is the one to do with censuses. It's a schedule number. OK, so if only there was a handy book. Well, if only there was a handy book. Well, I've written a couple of books, as Esther mentioned earlier. Um, Tracing Your Scottish Ancestry Through Church and State Records is the one that talks in detail about the, the history of the census and, and what you'll find within them. But I have another book called Tracing Your Scottish Family History on the Internet, um, published before my heritage put the census up on the on the website. I'm sure the, the, the second edition, uh, if and when it comes along, will go to town on the MyHeritage presentation. And um, I also have a new book that's just come out, which may be of interest, called Tracing Your Irish Ancestors Through Land Records, including the ebook versions of that, which are also now available through the Pen and Sword website. And um, as Esther uh, uh, mentioned earlier on, I teach courses. I, I do courses through a thing called Pharos Teaching and Tutoring Limited. 
And the next courses I'll be teaching in November are progressing your Irish research online and Scotland 1750 to 1850 beyond the old parish registers, which is where the fun begins and all our very weird records such as seasons and things like that get talked about. And I have a research service called Scotland's Greatest Story, um, simply named because the greatest story you will ever find in Scotland is your very own. And so thanks very much uh, for allowing me to, to provide this overview. Um, I also do a, a blog called Scottish Gene, Scottish Genealogy News and Events, and it's freely available on Blogger, and I can maybe now pass over to Esther, and I'm happy to take any questions, yeah. Okay, um, so thank you so much for that. That was that was so interesting. I, lo I loved what you said about um, being enumerated twice because uh, the enumerator goes down to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even sure that's true. It's just anecdotally, it seems possible. <laughs> Uh, fantastic. Uh, I definitely learned a lot and I think everyone here did in the comments. Uh, I see a lot of comments. So um, first of all, for everyone in the audience, if you have a question for Chris, please um, let us know in the comments section. We're happy to take a few questions. Uh, I did see a couple questions about um, how people can rewatch this amazing presentation because I know sometimes you know you miss a couple of things or you want to rewatch it. Um, so all of our presentations, all of our Facebook lives are available under the videos section on our, the My Heritage Facebook page. Um, so you'll see a few hundred Facebook lives that we've done since uh, since last year when when COVID broke broke out, and uh, we've just been doing these uh, Facebook lives since then and had some amazing, incredible guests since then. So so um, we do have a couple questions that we'll take from the audience, if that's okay, Chris. Uh, so the first one is from Tanya, and she asks, uh, how can I access the Scottish paternity court records? Oh, right, okay. Um, Scottish paternity court records. Uh, well, there's a, a very good way of doing that, uh, or a starting point for that, is a, a couple of friends of mine, um, Emma and Graham Maxwell, have a website called scottishindexes.com, and part of what they're doing is indexing records from the courts at the National Records of Scotland, which includes paternity claims. There is actually a database there of paternity claims. So you can go in to have a look at that. Um, in terms of whether there is a paternity claim, another thing to look out for, uh, and, and sorry, I should explain that Scottish Index's website has a guide to this as well. It's worth looking at. The, the, the records of birth as well that are available on the Scotland's People website You'll often find that if a child is recorded and the name of the father is not there, you might see a thing in the left-hand column that says View RCE, which means the Register of Corrected Entries. And if somebody has taken uh, someone to, to court as a putative father to get them to cough up on the money and support of the child, if the court has ruled, yes, he is the dad and needs to step up, you might find an entry recorded in this register of corrected entries, um, which is a separate document that's free to access in Scotland's people if you've already looked at the original record of, of the birth, and that might provide them additional information there. But certainly go to Scottish Indexes because they've got a great guide on the paternity claims um, as a starting point. But the, the records themselves are actually held at the National Records of Scotland. There are guides to court records on the National Record of Scotland website as well. They are a bit of a beast to use and that's why um, we are ever so grateful to Emmett and Graham and those who are helping them to, to index the records. They can be quite a, a problem. And um, they might also be possible, I think they might also be available on oldscottish.com which is another website um, which I believe has also got a, a paternity database. Um, so that's another one to look at as well. Um, but between those, that's a good starting point, really. So. Okay. Uh, we have a question here from John, and he asks, um, are there citations we can use as sources for Wikitree? Uh, does that mean from the My Heritage presentation of the records? I think um, so. I'm actually not sure. That's, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't recall seeing them. Um, I, I see that the source information is certainly there. You might have to construct your own um, citation, but the, the, the raw material for the source citations is there, which is not available on all websites that offer the, the records. I think what I would say is I think MyHeritage has done a good job from what I've seen so far on that. It's it's very important to have the correct source information recorded. And it is looking... There was one slight issue I noted with MyHeritage. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to... Um, but on um, some of the records for areas like Glasgow, for example, you might have a, a registration district or a parish down as 644. Normally they are subdivided 6441, 6442, and that kind of thing. I think they've just been recorded as 644 
on some of the records I've seen. So that, that might be one thing to, to maybe look into. And I, I need to look into that a bit more. Um, but most of the information is certainly there to construct a citation with. I'm just not sure at, at the top of my head whether at the bottom of the page, my already says, if you want to source this, uh, you know, want to cite this record, use this. And um, that's something you can maybe check when you go onto the site yourself. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Martha says, can you write a book about differentiating between the common surnames and given names? Talk about spending money on Scotland's people. <laughs> <laughs> Can I write a book? I'll write a book on anything. <laughs> um, there, there are, how can I say, Scottish names are a lot of fun. Um, but there are tools on sites such as Scotland's people. You can use things like um, uh, wild cards and, and surname variants and things like that to try to work out things. Um, it tends to be when you've got things like um, somebody who's called Janet going by the pet form of the name, which is Jesse. Or, or you know, um, what other ones would you have? Uh, I've, I've lost the plot. Uh, Peter instead of Patrick, or Patrick instead of Peter, they can be interchangeable. Um, Senga instead of Agnes, which is Agnes backwards. You, you sometimes see that recorded. And um, there, there are um, a lot of online sources that will tell you variants for names, and you can have various alternative spellings of names by ticking some of those boxes at the end of the fields that ask you to type in the name. Um, one thing you can do on Scotland's people as well is you can also search by a first name only or a surname only. You don't have to put the full name in. So if you know they were in a parish at a particular time, just put the first name in and just go through the list and see which one's looking more like the one you're trying to find and then narrow it down that way. What you can do in Scotland as well is you can go to the Scotland's People Centre or various centres across the country where you pay £15 unlimited access to all the records for the day for seven hours or so um and that way you can click on all of them to your heart's content you know um to narrow that down but i appreciate as i'm talking to the planet earth at the minute and not just a little clique that lives in scotland that may be a wee bit more difficult um but there's plenty of genealogists here as well who can help to to, to do that for you if, if there's a particular problem and um, there are ways and means of getting around it yeah. <laughs> Okay, Linda asked, uh, if someone was out at sea, would they also be on a census? How would they be listed? Uh, that's uh, interesting because I actually found one yesterday I was looking at. Um, somebody, oh, really? Yeah, there, there was somebody I was researching from Scotland who disappeared and I discovered they were at sea, I think it was in 1861, and they were listed, uh, the, one of the categories was they were at sea on HMS Edgar, which is a Royal Naval vessel. Um, so they, they will state that they are there. One... Um, I'm not sure if my heritage has this as a database. There are some um, muster roll substitutes as well for soldiers who are overseas that have been collated by um, individuals that are available online. I'm not sure if my heritage has that. Some groups might have that. Um, but in terms of the, the, the records of whether they're at sea, yes, you, you, you should find if they're at sea um, available on the database because I found it yesterday on my heritage. So. <laughs> Okay, great. We'll just take uh, one last question before we get to our winner today. Um, so this question is from, where was this question? Oh, I lost it. Okay, okay, here. Uh, this question is from Lloyd, and he said, I have found occupations like merchant for my Irish ancestors, like Forbes, Hamilton, and Tilly. Are there supplementary business or trade info that you can further consult for Scottish ancestors? Uh, okay, that, that that's a whole topic in its own self. And there, there are, yes, there, there, there may be records that are deposited with the national records or with a local archive. Um, newspapers will document uh, the, the dealings of businesses as well. Um, there's actually a newspaper called the Edinburgh Gazette that is freely available online. Um, the the gazette.com, I think it is, or gazettes, I can't remember, singular or plural. Um, but what that's very useful for is it tells you when um, businesses uh, appoint new partners and when they um, go bankrupt and all these kind of different things that might happen. Um, there was one time I was doing research for a business in Glasgow and I went to the, the library there in Glasgow City Archives and the records were catalogued as being held at the archive. And I discovered that when I arrived that the records had gone missing in the archive because they'd been filed in the wrong place. So they're still there somewhere, but they didn't know where they were. I was able to construct the history of that company by using the Gazette and other contemporary sources as well. And um, one other thing as well is that in some cases, the company may still exist or may have been bought over and the records may still be held by that company. So there's a, a thing that you can access called, called the National Records uh, sorry, the National Register of Archives for Scotland, um, which is on the National Records of Scotland website, which is a database of business records that have been catalogued and, and other privately held records where you can actually write through the National Records of Scotland and say, I see you have 
the records of this institution from that period. Could I possibly come along and look at them? You have no automatic right to go and see them, but if you write it very, very nicely and in your best English, you know, with a big smiley face at the end of it, uh, you might get away with it and, and they might allow you to come and see it. And again, I've done this. There was um, a history of uh, a, a deaf institution, I think it was actually in Glasgow from the mid 19th century, which I discovered a business in Glasgow still had the original records for, for various reasons. And that's how I gained access to those records. So th it is possible in some cases. In some cases, though, the records may not have survived. And that, that's just a sad thing. So I would try the newspapers as well uh, and see what they might have. But you sh and, and street directories and trade directories and, and all sorts of resources. There's a ton of stuff out there. My goodness, buy my book. It has it all listed in there. All the resources that are online, that'll get you started. And if, the, and if they're not there, I'll write another book. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll be waiting to read it. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so a couple questions I see again about how to rewatch the session. So in case you missed and you want to rewatch today's fantastic session with Chris, uh, you can do so. You just go to the My Heritage Facebook page and under the video section, it will be saved there as soon as we're done today. So um, so make sure to check that out and uh, rewatch this session as well as all of our previous sessions. Uh, so now we're really excited to give away uh, My Heritage DNA Kit to one lucky winner. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, drum roll. <laughs> drum roll. Um, so uh, we received so many fantastic comments here uh, in the audience. I'm sure you can all just go through the comments and, and they're really great. We love, we love asking this question because um, I think it's something that we can all relate to here in MyHeritage, <laughs> many, most of the people in our audience. Um, and so the winner is Elaine Grimley Sable. And Elaine wrote to us and she said, um, you know you're a genealogist when? And she said, I wish happy birthday and happy anniversary to my dead ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a great one, Elaine. Thank and um, congratulations on winning a My Heritage DNA kit. We'll be in touch with you through private message to claim your prize. Uh, and thank you everyone who wrote in and who participated in today's Facebook Live. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. No, you're very welcome. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> it was. It was a lot of fun. And uh, we hope you have the best birthday. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have to plan for another one on your birthday next year. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's do this with annual tradition. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Bye, everyone. Have a great day.